Hello and welcome back to Book Talk. It is so much fun to have you join us today where we're doing something a little different. We're, we're going to be talking with two of my friends who write biblical fiction. And many of you have probably read at least one book by Angela Hunt because she is one of the most prolific writers that I have ever had the privilege of getting to know and call friend. And then we're also going to connect with Connell and Cassette as well. And both of them write biblical fiction, which is one of those genres that I'm not going to say I'd never write, because as soon as I say that, God's going to be like, well, guess what you're writing next, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's something that I think is uh, really important because it helps us imagine what was happening and, and kind of brings to life the biblical stories that we may know really well, but also carries a certain weight with it. But before we get to all that, Angela, I'll start with you. Do you want to just give us a quick background for people who may not be familiar with you and everything that you've done? Okay. Um, a, as you said, Kara, my name is Angie Hunt and well, it's Angela on the books, but everybody who knows me calls me Angie. And I live in Florida with my husband. I have two children, three adorable grandchildren. And right now I have chickens in my office and three dogs in the house and 12 baby chicks in my kitchen so, because it's spring, why else? And um, I've written in all kinds of genres, everything from children's picture books to contemporary novels, to suspense, to legal, and have lately been doing a lot of what we call biblical fiction. But you know, I really hate that term because if it's biblical, it shouldn't be fiction. <laughs> I like to call it historical fiction with biblical characters, but that's mm -hmm. not concise. So everybody calls it biblical fiction. And I guess I have to be okay with that. So anyway, um, I am happy writing and I'll just hand it over to Colin. <laughs> Well, hi, I'm I'm Connie Lynn, and it's actually I know it sounds it looks like Connie Lynn, but it's actually Connie Lynn, and uh, I too write biblical fiction. I actually what I call it is biblical era fiction. That oh. seems to work. That seems to to explain it better to me because I yeah the biblical fiction thing is a little confusing, but. Um, I've been writing since, oh, I think 2016. Um, I think I'm on book, oh, 15 or 16, something like that now. And um, I have uh, two kids. I have an 18-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter who I homeschool while I'm writing books. So it's a little crazy around our house, but it works. That's awesome. And it's always fascinating to me how many of us either started or are writing and homeschooling. And it's there's quite a cluster. Um, those days are behind me now, but it definitely was when I was in the starting days of it was definitely well into the weeds of homeschooling. I'm, as, I'm almost done. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I had 12 years in. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, I don't know if I can do this another 10 years. Unlike <laughs> Trisha Goyer, who I think will be doing it for the rest Maybe. of her life, which is awesome. Um, so, Connie Lynn, let's start with you because yours, which is coming out in August, um, Voice of the Ancient, and I know it's not your first book, so you can talk about kind of in general, or you can talk about this book specifically, but when you talk about biblical era fiction, uh, this one at least is set during like the very earliest days of the Old Testament, um, you know, the beginning of the kings, uh, specifically Saul, which is so fun. Uh, one of the first scenes involves, you know, Saul being not present during the casting of lots and all of that. How did you land on that story as where you were going to kind of anchor this book and that time period out of everything in the Bible? Because there's so much. I think that would be the, if I were going to be writing that time period, or that era, that would be the first challenge is figuring out, okay, what part am I going to pull out? Sure. Well, part of the part of the reason why I wrote in that specific era is because I had written the Covenant House series right before that. And um, that takes place in the end of the judges and like Samuel being the judge um, time period. And I just fell in love with the family so much that I was writing about. I didn't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, OK, well, let's just move into the next era. And of course, that's when Saul is king. And, you know, we kind of 
skim over that early time. There's not a whole lot about Saul during that era. And so it just intrigued me to think about what would what was it like during that kind of transitional time for for Israel and and what was going on behind the scenes, you know, because mm-hmm. that's kind of the way I write is what's what's behind the scenes of what's going on. So, um, yeah, it's just my curiosity that ends up deciding for me where I want to write. And I, I think that's a, a great way to approach it, because there are so many missing at gaps, I'm going to call it, but like details that God doesn't flesh out in scripture. Yes. And Angela or Angie, that's really kind of the part that you have really focused on in the last couple of series, but even with this book, The Woman from Lydia, in that you were really pulling out some of those people that often get overlooked in history and not just in the Bible, but in ancient history in general, women. And why did you do that? Because some of these women get barely even a sentence and you're like okay so what's what's back there what's the rest of the story yes exactly well i was um well i had just come off the jerusalem road series which talked about jesus's siblings and the people around him and you know a lot of christian readers are really particular if you put any words at all into jesus's mouth that he did not really say and so for me the easiest way around that is not to have Jesus on stage very much, but to sort of keep him over here and make the story about the people that are around him. So I had just come off those four. And so I was sort of moving. Well, I did the the silent year series, which is during the intertestamental period. Then I moved into the early New Testament, the gospels. And then I thought, well, I just want to kind of write my way through the Bible and I'll just go now. Uh, to the emissary series, which are people who were Gentiles and in the churches where Paul first brought the gospel. So Lydia was in the church at Philippi, and uh, I actually don't think her name was Lydia, (laughs) Um, because in the book of Philippians, I mean, he was writing to them and he never mentions Lydia, uh, and she started the church in her house. She was a pillar of the church. So why wouldn't he say, hello, Lydia? But he talks about you, Odia, and um, that other, the synecdoche, and how they were squabbling and said, you know, tell those women to get along. And, And so I found some cooperating research that said she was from the province of Lydia and had moved to Philippi. So everybody probably called her the Lydian woman, that Lydian woman, and somehow it gotten shortened to uh, Lydia. And so in my book, she's actually called Euodia. That's hard to say. It was much easier to yeah. say. So, um, but I just came up with a story for her because if a woman moved out of her city to another city, as the Bible tells us Lydia did, there's a story behind that because people just did not leave their hometowns. And so I had to give her a good reason for doing that and then create her backstory. And um, this one actually has romance in it. And I usually don't have uh, very much romance in my books. They actually kiss at the end. I mean, I was so excited. So anyway, (laughs) but that's it. Yeah. I love that. And what a lot of people may not know about you, Angie, is that you actually have your PhD. You went and Um, got... It's a THD, and I have a doctorate in biblical studies, and then a THD, which is a doctorate in pure theology, theology proper. And so, I mean, you're being really careful to get the information right, and I think that's important for people to know, and you don't have to have the degrees to write in this space and to do a good job and to do the research, but I do think it, it adds a little not weight, but a little authority to what you were doing. Um, and to that, when you say, oh, I ha- I found a source. Yeah, you didn't just find a source. You found a source. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's part of it. So um, what is like one of the craziest things you've had to research while writing these books set in any part of the Bible? Well, um, all right, one thing. I'm really excited about a nonfiction book I have coming out in September. It's a Christmas Advent devotional. And 
I got the idea because I was doing all this research for my novels and I kept thinking, well, we've got that wrong and we've got that wrong and we've so got that wrong. And I wrote the uh, novel that went along with the movie, The Nativity Story. And I learned that, all right, we always see Mary and Joseph walking together and that dog on donkey, right? Well, the truth is that they would have traveled in a group, not by themselves. And the donkey, Mary would not have ever ridden on the donkey because if they had a donkey, it would have been carrying the water jars and their food and their provisions and their blankets and that sort of thing. And if anybody was put on the donkey, it would have been the man, not the women, because men were the leaders. So, um, but what is most likely is that they fell into a traveling group and they were all traveling together. And if somebody had a wagon, Mary probably could have ridden in the wagon. So all those pictures of Mary on a donkey walking beside Jesus, uh, Joseph, they're just wrong. They're wrong. And I go into a lot of detail in that, in that Christmas book about that poor donkey. He's been so, well, he's actually been elevated far more than he is due, I think. And that's hilarious. I know. I, so Connie Lynn, how about you? What's one of the things that, I mean, because 15, 16 books, you've done a lot of research. What's something that you're like, we've had this wrong for a very long time? Oh, goodness. Um, I can't even think of anything <laughs> off the top of my head. Isn't that the funny thing? Because, you know, as we do all this research, we're always like, oh my gosh, I never knew that. And then we keep writing and we keep going and we forget about it. But at the time, it can be so surprising. So when you've written your, because you've got this book and you were talking about the series with Samuel, what are some of your other books about? Have all of yours been set during the Old Testament? Um, the, the vast majority are. I did, a, I did one book um, for uh, the Guidepost Fiction series, the Ordinary Women of the Bible series, and that was the woman with the issue of blood. So that's the only one I've done in the New Testament. Um, so I'm just kind of camping out in the Old Testament for now because it's fascinating to me. And there's just, there's so much that I can work mm -hmm. with and so many different stories that in places I could go. So, so yeah. when you're looking for your stories in set in the Old Testament, what is that piece that you're like, okay, yeah, this is a Connie Lynn story because mm -hmm. not every episode from the Bible, not every chapter is going to become one of your books. So how do you go? Oh, Yep, that's it's that's it. usually it's usually some little piece <laughs> that I found and I think, oh, that is so interesting. Like um, I, I was reading as I was working through the Out from Egypt series that takes place, begins in the Exodus and goes through um, the fall of Jericho. Um, I read the little the little part where it talks about how Canaanite women could be taken captive and they could actually marry them, but they had to shave their heads and cut their fingernails and take off their Canaanite clothes. And then they had to mourn their family for 30 days before they could um, marry the Hebrew man. And so that just fascinated me that I thought, oh my goodness, how would it be for a Canaanite woman to um, have to do all that? And so that was just one little thing. And my whole book came out of that. So I, it's just those, wow. those funny little things. The reason why I started that, that first book that I wrote is because I read about how it said that the, um, a mixed multitude, um, went up with the Hebrews. And I started to think about, okay, who are these people? Who are these foreigners? Were the Egyptians? Why did they choose to come? So a lot of times it's just one little, <laughs> one little yeah. thing that'll spark a whole series. <laughs> I love it. And, you know, it doesn't matter what time period we write. So many of us, there's that what if, and the what if gets us started. But in your case, that what if may be one verse. And then you start wondering and you start going, okay, Holy Spirit, what's behind this? What's, what, why did you include this in the Bible out of all the things you could have included? What are we supposed to get from this? And yeah, I think that's I fascinating. That the little uh, um, part where it talks about the cities of refuge and how somebody, if they accidentally killed someone, could run to these cities. And I didn't know much about it. It's a, just a very small piece, but yeah. it became such a beautiful picture to me of Jesus that I had I had so much fun writing the first three books. It was originally supposed to be three books that I asked them to please let me write a fourth one because I just, it was so cool to um, think about what that would be like to have to run for your life to this city. and. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about. That's really fun. So Angie, has there been a, 
a series because you've written so many books. I mean, you're what over 300 books. It's you and Melody Carlson are like way out there. No, Mel probably has 300, but I last time I counted, it was about 155, maybe. But it's been a while. That's, since I that's still amazing to me. 155. I'm working on number 41, I think, right now. And I just can't even imagine getting that far. But has there been a book that you've written where you just didn't expect it? And then all of a sudden you had like this whole idea in your head and you just had to sit down and write it? Yes. Um the debt it's a contemporary novel which i know we're a little off topic but i got the whole idea just after reading that scripture and hearing um cc winan sing the alabaster box and then that yeah. story about the woman who poured the oil on jesus and i just started thinking about to there's like people who've been forgiven the most appreciate the most and so that whole contemporary story came out of that. And it just came to me in a flash, in the shower, actually. And um, I get my best ideas in the showers, don't you? I hear that's a great place. So I'm not alone in that. But, um, and I just had to sit down and write it. And I explained it to my editor. I said, please let me write this. And so they did. And um, it is a book that convicted me as much as anything. The main gist of it is, I know way too many Christians who are so cloistered in their church that they don't have a world to be a witness in because they mm -hmm. spend all their time in Christian church and Christian ministry and Christian whatever. They don't even know unsafe people. So anyway, that was the gist of it. And that was how it convicted me. That is phenomenal. I love that. Um, Okay, so it's always so fun to talk about the books, but now I want to talk about your writing process. So we've talked a little bit about how you've gotten some of your what ifs, but are you a pantser or a plotter? And Angie, I'm going to start with you because you have your whole skeleton. And do you um, do that with every book? Or, I'm... okay, so explain to, and like the, I know you teach like whole day long classes on this, but what is that? Because most people, won't really know, but it's like this whole system. Right. Um, well, I was once doing this thing and they asked me to teach plotting to third graders. And I thought, okay, I've really got to boil it down to basics. And so I came up with, um, you know, the knee bone connected to the ankle bone. And so I thought, you know, that kind of really works. So you start with the head, who's the main character, and then that connects to an inciting incident. And then they set a goal and then there are complications and then there's um, a bleak moment and then the character always learns a lesson, makes a decision and then there's a resolution. So for every book, I draw this little skeleton and I figure out what's happening at the beginning and I give my characters um, needs, problems, uh, good qualities and make sure they're all brought up in the first 20% of the book. And then we go into the adventure of the complications and the goal and all that sort of thing. So that much of it is an outline. So I have this very bare bones, pun intended, outline. Um, so I know where I'm going and I don't really go off on rabbit trails, but at the same time, that gives me enough liberty to think, you know, three drafts in, oh, why don't they do this? And so I've got the freedom to write that in. So I love it. For me, it's a hybrid. It's not total plotting and it's not total seat of the pants because I know where I'm going, but it gives me just enough structure that I can jump in and tackle it. I love that. And it really is a great way for people to get started because mm -hmm. some people just insist, if I plot, I'm not going to write the book because it doesn't help me out. And I'm writing a book right now that because of my prior book, um, having to completely upend it, I don't have a lot of time to write this one. And it's the prequel to the one that's coming out that I've already written. And so I had to do a detailed outline, but let me tell you, I wrote 11,000 words over the weekend because I knew I know exactly what's happening because I spent a lot of time because I needed to for the macro edit for the other book because I needed to weave in a couple of things where I'm like I had to know what happens I was like I forgot how easy it is to write a book when I've plotted it all out because it's just stringing the beads together but yeah. Catalan, how do you do it do you 
plot pants? Are you in between, kind of like a skeleton? What's your system? Well, I'm a little bit of a hybrid too. Um, I actually have a, an extra uh, part of my process, which is I, I have some girlfriends that I plot with and we do a retreat once a year. Um, I, I write with uh, Tammy L. Gray, Nicole Deese, Amy Mattio, and Christy Barrett. And so once a year we go to um, uh, one side of the, the country, we go to North Carolina, and then the other side we go to Post Falls, Idaho. And um, so I usually will come with a very kind of bare bones idea, and then we plot it all together. And we just throw out as many ideas as we possibly can. And sometimes some of them are pretty crazy. And sometimes those crazy ideas turn into something else. And so usually by the time I'm done with that retreat, that week-long retreat, I have at least two books really plotted out. Um, and then I take that home, put it into my Scrivener and um, kind of build from there. And then I'm I'm pretty much of a pantser when it comes to inside the scene and inside the chapter. So I kind of, that's, that's become my rhythm now is that, that re retreat every year and those girls help. So yeah, it's, that's awesome. Uh, it, yeah. I, I, I'm definitely a hybrid for sure. Well, and there's something magical that happens when you get in a room with people who know you, they know your books, and they care deeply about your success. And the way the ideas just ping off of each other is so much fun. It is. Um, and the cool thing is we're, we all write different things. I'm, I'm biblical. Um, a couple of the other girls write contemporary. One writes mystery and uh, romantic suspense. So we kind of draw from each other's kind of different wells of knowledge and and that has really helped I think grow me as a writer and as um, um, the rest of us just kind of push each other in, an, in a different ways. That's awesome and you mentioned Scrivener now Angie you use Scrivener don't you? Absolutely love it. Yeah so let it anymore. <laughs> And there are a lot of people who that is absolutely an indispensable tool for them. So let's talk just a minute about that, because um, when I, people talk to me about, OK, I want to be a writer and I'm like, OK, you need a system, you need a tool. And the first bunch of my books were all written on Word, just like this in order, in sequence, because I was writing for publishers that needed that wanted a chapter by chapter. So it was very easy to do sequentially. But if you're not writing sequentially or you need to move things around and things like that, that's a nightmare because mm -hmm. it's not easy to cut and paste and move things around. So Angie, why are you a, cause you're like almost an evangelist for Scrivener. Why has yeah. it been a great tool for you? And then Connie Lynn will come to you. I used to, um, when I was writing in Word because that's pretty much all there was, I used to also have open Ask Sam, which was a database that was word searchable. So I would just copy and paste all my research and stick it in Ask Sam. I would have Microsoft Excel open um, because I always created my timelines and scene outlines in that. And then I'd have a dictionary and thesaurus open. And I had all these various programs open and I was always switching between the programs. And then when I wanted to listen to a chapter, I write as much with my ears as with my eyes, maybe more with my ears actually. Um, I would have to get another program that would read it to me. And then I discovered Scrivener and it does all of that mm -hmm. so easily. And so now I only write with Scrivener open. I've written a screenplay in Scrivener, which is a whole new thing for me. I discovered it's fun. Um, I've written picture books in Scrivener because it's just so easy to see your, you know, a thousand words that way. Um, nonfiction, fiction, my dissertations, um, all that sort of stuff. And it's so simple to keep everything together. And a lot of people, you know, they use all the features like, the chapter folders and scenes. And I don't even do that. I just create the manuscript script and write scene by scene by scene by scene by scene because I am always one who's dropping and paste, moving things around. And the very last thing I do before I hand a book in is decide where the chapter breaks are going to be. So I don't know where the chapters are when I'm writing the first four or five drafts, but then I put them in and that's simple too. I just go to those breaks and write chapter <laughs> it's so hard and um but I love scripture and uh, scr scripture I love that too but <laughs> and, you know now they've even updated it so you can uh export directly as pdfs and 
well, they've always had Word docs and Kindles and they've made it so simple and up to date. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. And Catalin, why do you love it? Well, you know, what I love about it is I'm a very visual person. And so I love being able to um, make my chapters colored so I can see exactly which one is which point of view. I'll make, you know, I'll do pink for the heroine and blue for the hero. And that kind of helps me. And I'll change the color to darker when I edit it so I can see what I've edited and what I haven't. Um, and so that kind of just, it motivates me to be able to see it laid out really well. And I actually made my own kind of format. So I, I have, um, kind of the the little labels of where the hero's journey kind of is laid uh -huh. out. I have little tags so I can see where I need to be, where I need to hit midpoint, where I need to hit, you know, 75%. Um, and so really for me, it's just having that like external layout already ready for me so that when I start a new book, I don't have to redo it all again and figure out where everything um, flows together. So, oh, I love, I love Scrivener. I would, I honestly don't think I could ever write without it again. <laughs> And don't you yeah. love the daily goals? You oh, can set mm -hmm. up like yes. say, you've got to write 3,000 words a day. And the minute yes. I hear that bell chime, I'm like, it's I'm awesome. out here. Yes. <laughs> the only problem is when it keeps going, when you, if you procrastinate and it keeps going up and up and up and up. Oh, and yeah. Up. So many words a day. Yeah. 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 But even that is great. Like I used to have the Excel spreadsheet where I would track my word count and I love to see it grow. And I was like, oh, I'm getting closer. Uh, but what's, funny is because I I don't always want to carry my laptop with me I be, I use the quill which is a website a web-based cloud-based which is basically Scrivener but it allows me to be on any computer and do that and so oh, wow. I but I can't write in Scrivener but I love it for research I love it for organizing my research and everything and so mm -hmm. I did that a lot but for some reason I could never actually write in it which is crazy because the quill is basically the exact same thing and I can write like nobody's business in it. It's the weirdest thing. So, but because- They have a cool graph too. I've, I've played with quill a little bit and they have a really cool graph so you can see your word count. Yeah. So like I have to write this book in two weeks. And so I knew like this weekend that and basically like a, a 20 minute timer because I'm writing in 20 minute sprints. And so I know I can write six or 800 words in that 20 minute sprint. And then I, I was like, okay, I'm done. Get up, do something for five minutes and then sit my butt back down. And that's how I could do that five and 6,000 words. Um, and now hopefully I can keep it up for, well, I have to for eight more days and then that book will be done. Um, and so you learn those tricks, mm -hmm. but I didn't used to write this way, but mm -hmm. right now, just the season of life I'm in, this is how I have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I actually write all my books by hand now, even though I say I use Scrivener, I, I write first by hand the entire manuscript and then I'll put it in chapter by chapter into oh. Scrivener and then I edit at once it's in Scrivener then it's edited as I do it so and I love writing by hand it for some reason it it just makes my brain a little bit more imaginative and I can yeah get in the zone and I I it turns off my inner editor because I can just you know if I mess something up I just scratch it out and keep going usually my pages are a horrible mess yeah. but and then I have to like translate my own handwriting, but um, it really <laughs> has become um, the way that I get into that flow zone easily. And I, I can do whatever I want. I don't, you know, I can go to the coffee shop and just take my little notebook and write it by hand. Yeah. I When I get stuck, that's one of my techniques mm -hmm. is I'll get out a, a pad of paper and I'll start writing. And usually I find on about page three whatever was sticking, it was kind of like the barrier is freed up. And then I'm like, I'm not writing fast enough. And then I switch back because mm. I, I do have that really fast pace. Um, and so then I'll get frustrated. I'll be like, okay, I'm typing again, but there's, there is something there about is. the writing it by hand that can really, when I'm truly it stuck. It's both hemispheres of your brain at the same time. Yeah. And so it sparks different things. Yeah. That is fascinating though. I can't imagine writing a hundred thousand, you know, yeah. however many words it, this is. By the time I'm done, it's pretty thick all <laughs> the papers. Wow. That's phenomenal. That's crazy. All right. So um, I'll ask one last question. What is the best book that you've read in the last six months? Kind of Lynn. Oh, yeah. I've been making Angie answer all the questions first. And now I'm going to make you. Let me think. 
Well, I mean, I'm just going to have to plug my friend's book because it's coming out soon. And um, she wrote a, a book called The Words We Lost, Nicole Deese. She's kind of- It my, is sitting on my desk upstairs. It's awesome. It's so good. And it ties into the publishing industry and there's a lost manuscript and oh my goodness, it's so much fun. And I really hope everybody goes out and buys it because it's a, it's a really cool book and, and it's so unique and different. So yeah. I love that. And Angie, what's yours? Well, I just started this one today in the dentist office, um, but the writing is so beautiful. I know it's going to be one of the best books of probably the year for me. And um, it's about giraffes and I love animals. So um, I just, I mean, I don't know. What, well, I do kind of know the, the bones of the story and a friend recommended it to me, but the writing, I just sit there and go, Oh, I wish I could write like that. I mean, it's really lovely. To check that one. Out. I yeah, I love books like that where the writing captivates me because as an author, that can be so hard. And it's West with Giraffes by Linda Rutledge. Exactly. Uh huh. Okay, I'm taking a note because I'm always looking for good ones. One that my daughter recommended. It's so fun now that my kids are making book recommendations to me. Uh, was Fox and I. I don't know if you've read that. It's a memoir and it's written by a young woman who's um, neurodivergent. She's probably on the autism spectrum, but she has like a PhD in conservation biology kind of stuff. And it's so fresh and unique. It's a really fun audiobook, And so I've been enjoying that one. But because of your love for animals, Angie, that might be a fun one to try too. It's about a real fox. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. it's this gal who's living this really interesting life, but it's her interactions with this fox. And so she's like this wildlife biologist and it's really interesting. It's a very fresh perspective. So thank cool. you both so much for joining me today. It's been so fun to connect and to oh. learn more about how you approach these biblical fiction or biblical era fiction novels, uh, because I think it's it's so fascinating. And it's something, like I said, that I would really approach with fear and trembling, but having read both of yours, you do such a beautiful job bringing these stories that are related to what's in the Bible to life, which then makes it so much easier to imagine what's actually happening in the scripture. So thank you again for joining me today. Well, thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. It's good to see you both. Yes.